Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'al habtifillah The Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam said Min yiradallahu bihi khayran yafaqo fiddeen Whenever Allah wants good for a person, He gives him understanding of the religion. And so fiqh fi deen, ahabatifillah, is something that we're all in need of. Because all of us want to come closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. And with that being the case, it's imperative that we study, that we atlab al-ilm. And so I thought it would be beneficial for those who are on the path of Talib al-Ilm to get an introduction to what is known as Qawaid al-Fiqiyya and especially the Qawaid al-Fiqiyya al-Khamsa or Sitta the main Fiqh principles uh, which are known as Qawaid al kulliya you know, that these are general principles or general Qawaid and foundations for understanding uh, the evidences regarding uh, fiqh, regarding the science of fiqh jurisprudence. And I wanted to make a very basic, basic series of durus uh, in order for for basically for two reasons the first reason being as a maraja as a revision for myself and number two as an introduction to those people who may not be students of knowledge but just so that they get another to or another understanding of what it goes into making a hukum, making a ruling, a judgment about something, or fatawa that the ulama uh, use to deduce uh, rulings. And with that being the case, we have to understand that this distinguishes by knowing these kind of kawaid, you know, usul of fiqh, kawaid fiqiyya, and these various sciences. That distinguishes between a strong student of knowledge who Allah has favored with those with that fiqh, that understanding, to someone else who may not be favored in that way. And again, that goes back to the hadith that we mentioned, Fiddin, whenever Allah wants good for a person, he gives him understanding fiqh fiddin. Because you will have some individuals that are very good in memorization, they memorize a lot. But when it comes to fiqh and understanding, maybe because of their background and their understanding and what they have not studied or what they did not understand or whatever the various reasons, they don't have much fiqh. They don't have much understanding of how to make istanbat, you know, how to, to find the evidence for a particular ruling and how that ruling is evidenced from the adilla, from the... Uh, from the proofs of the Quran and the Sunnah or the Ijma, those things which are uh, a consensus of the ulama. So then on the other hand you have those who Allah has favored with a lot of fiqh that they have strong understanding in uh, the sciences of fiqh and how to uh, deduce uh, ahkam, you know, rulings, how, how they derive rulings, and so on and so forth. And that comes from fiqh fiddin. And both are needed, meaning a person needs fiqh, and of course they need to memorize. And so I thought it'd be good, and we'll make this a very brief sittings, hopefully in five sittings or so, that will just give a very brief introduction for the lay persons, if you will, uh, to get an introduction and for the student of knowledge, the one beginning on the path of, of seeking knowledge, for them to also get some sort of uh, understanding of things that they will probably study much more in depth in the future. And so, 
we are going to use a text which is known as Al Wajiz fi Idah Kawaid al Fiqiyah al Kulliyah. And this is a very well known text here, uh, which is used in some of the universities, Islamic universities, and some of the uh, Islamic institutes. And this is a, a book that we studied in Merkaz Ta'lim, the Kitab wa Sunnah. And it is a very uh, beneficial book and very gives you a, a nice tasawwur, a nice uh, understanding. The term qa'ida refers to, uh, as a term we could say, the meaning is uh, al-asl or asas, meaning uh, foundation, uh, the foundation or the origin of something. And the plural is qawaid, and this is why you have a lot of books for those who study uh, aqidah books and are aware of things like uh, the book Usul al-Thalatha or Qawaid al-Arba or uh, Usul al-Sitta and things like this, you have the term Qawaid, meaning it's a, the plural form of foundation or Usul. And when we refer to Qawaid Fiqiyah, the scholars, they differ immensely in their definitions of how to define uh, that science. You know, there's many different uh, ta'rifat or definitions and we'll just take a basic one that we can understand and comprehend in English for our usage and we'll briefly, briefly talk about because it's a very difficult uh, distinguishment as the scholars even uh, to, uh, you know, differ over the uh, definition but to distinguish between uh, Asul al Fiqh and Qawaid Fiqiyah. That we're not going to go into depth, but we'll just mention maybe one or two things that, uh, points that differ or differentiate those two uh, sciences. So, first, when we talk about uh, uh, Qawaid Fiqiyah, we're talking about, for example, a general principle that covers a variety of scenarios, okay? A general principle or rule that covers a lot of different rulings. Also, some of the scholars, they mention uh, that this is also, this is uh, a general or a, in, uh, an encompassing principle or a principle which encompasses uh, many different ahkam, many different rulings. And that allows for a person, uh, a scholar, to make uh, rulings and judgments based upon that. And so when we look at the Qawaid Fiqiyah, we are talking about, as most of these Qawaid in Fiqh, they are Qawaid or principles which are Aglabiyah, which mean that they are general principles which govern the scenario which is most often the case, meaning that, that the Qawaid, the qawaid are, are derived from the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the Minhaj of the Salaf and that these Qawaid don't necessarily, they don't precede the text. So these Qawaid that the scholars uh, made istanbat or that they derived these principles from the divine text and these general principles that they are the majority of the situation or they don't encompass every particular issue or situation necessarily. So that is something else just for our general knowledge. When we talk about the differences between Qawaid Fiqiyah 
and uh, Asul Afik, for example, one of the things in which we, the scholars uh, use to differentiate these two sciences, for example, Qawaid al-Asul, um, the Asul, Asul Afik, it has to do more with al with with um, the way language is used to deduce uh, a hukum in the science. And this is why we also emphasize the strength of a person's Arabic language, that a person learns Arabic very strongly because the stronger your Arabic is, the easier it is for a person to enter into these sciences because usul of fiqh relies heavily, as all the sciences do, but especially usul of fiqh and some of the other sciences rely very uh, much upon the uh, linguistic principles. So, for example, when we say al amr yufid al wujub, which is something I mention in a lot of our uh, lectures. Al Amr Yafidu Wuju, meaning that a whenever there's a command in the Shar Ghalibin, okay, this is Aglabi in general, it means that that command is is uh, an obligation. Al Amr Yafidu Wuju. So this has to do how do we know what's a, a, a an Amr, an Amr, a command? That has to do with going back to the to the language, okay, the Arabic language, and even in English. Of course, you have what uh, the the emir would be the imperative form. Okay, so it has to do with a command. When you say, for example, "Don't do this," that is a command or a prohibition. You are prohibiting someone from doing something. And we say "Anahi yufid tahrim that when there's a prohibition, it shows that something is prohibited. Okay, when there's a uh, something in the imperative form, which is prohibiting something, it shows that it's a prohibition. And so, to know that, that means we're going back to the language to look at that. Uh, and so that's why it's important to know Usul Afik. So that's what Usul Afik is concerned about those linguistic terminologies, especially linguistic terms, uh, in order to derive a hukum, to derive a ruling. And Qawaid Faqiyah, on the other hand, uh, is concerned more with the general principles derived directly from the text. And we're going to mainly just get into, so you know, we're trying to do our best to give you a just a basic, some basic background. But I think what's going to going to be much more useful for us is when we get into uh, these these principles we're going to talk about. So in our study or our revision, we're going to talk about the five main uh, kawaid, five very important kawaid raisiya, uh, and. These five principles are principles which the fuqaha, meaning from the various madahib, that they agree upon. And that's why they are called the uh, kawa'id al-kubra, you know, the, the overall uh, principles, the major overall principles, because they are ones that the, the fuqaha agree on uh, with the various madhabs. And there are six that are generally mentioned but we're only going to take uh, the first five, and they are as follows. So the first uh, principle is the qaida in ma'amalu bin niyat o al amur bi maqasidiha. The first principle is coming from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in ma'amalu bin niyat. Verily, actions are tied to the intentions, and uh, Another way of putting it, or it, and it has various, each one of these kawaii, they have other principles under them, uh, is al amur bi muqasidiha, that the uh, affair or issue at hand is in accordance with the, in, its, uh, is its intention. 
And we'll talk about these each with a meaning and give us some examples and then we'll move on because we again this is an introductory um, discussion. The second qaida or principle that we'll, we'll talk about al yaqeen la yazul o la yartafa la yartafa bishak that doubtfulness um, uh, certainty is not removed by doubtfulness and it's very important that just to get an introduction of these qawaid you'll see how that's going to help you uh, in your practice what if you can uh, understand these principles it helps you with many many things in the deen and that's the whole point of these qawaid qawaid these are general principles that encompass most of the religion okay uh, and they come from Nasus as well, of course. Uh, the third principle is Al Mashaka Tajlibu Taysir. Is that uh, difficulty facilitates ease. Or ease, ease should be in place of difficulty. And well, again, we're going to talk about the meaning of these Kawaii, and that'll make it much more clear. This is just an introduction into the principles that we're going to be taking. Uh, and then the fourth uh, principle is la darar wa la dirar, also coming from a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu or another way it's put uh, al darar yuzul, that uh, harm is removed. Uh, and la darar wa la dirar, kama qala the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, means that there is no harm nor is there reciprocating harm. So the Sharia encourages us not to harm others and to avoid harm. And avoid harmfulness. Uh, and then the last principle that we'll talk about is al ada uh, muhakkam or muhakkama, that the uh, custom, you know, returning to custom when there's uh, differences, when there's differences. And again, we're going to talk about that as we get into it. So the first uh, principle that uh, we're going to look at is the qaida al-amur bi muqasidiha that the uh, issue or affair is in accordance with its intention and as the Prophet Sallallahu said in the Ma'mal al yat verily actions are tied to the intentions this is your first principle and this comes the, the dalil or evidence for this qaida is that very hadith the hadith uh, Anamir al Mu'minin Abi Hafs Umar bin al Khattab uh, Abu Hafs Umar bin al Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu qala sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul inna ma'mal al binyat wa inna maliku al limri al manawa fa man kana al hijratu ila Allah wa rasuli fa yajitu ila Allah wa rasuli wa man kana al hijratu li dunya yusibaha aw imra'atan yankihaha fa hijratu ila ma hajara ilayhi akhrajahu shaykhan in this hadith, it's in Bukhari and Muslim. So this is evidence for this principle. The Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, actions are tied to the intentions, and everyone will get that for which he intended. Therefore, he who migrates for Allah and his messenger, then he has migrated for Allah and his messenger. And he who migrates to take some woman in marriage or for some worldly gain, then he will get that for which he migrated for. So it lets us know, Habatifillah, that in regards to should, uh, our actions that there must be an intention behind it there must be an intention behind it so when we want to make ibadah and that goes to the principles of, of worship what is worship in Islam or how do we define what is good sound worship in Islam we define that by looking at is it sincerely done uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's done to worship Allah ikhlas okay that is that qaida that is the principle we're talking about that you have sincerity in your ibadah and then the second principle is that you that there's mutabah that it's following the sunnah the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so for example if we look at uh, someone who's praying and even their their prayer looks very good. It looks like what we understand from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're making Ruku' and Sujood perfectly and they're pausing in between with comfort 
and uh, uh, doing all the, the rituals of prayer, the physical rituals of prayer. However, they, their intention, their maqasid, or their intention, is to worship uh, or is to, uh, is direct, is seeking intercession from the grave. You know, they're praying before a grave because they believe that person in the grave is going to help them come closer to Eliza or Joe. Then that, what does that mean? That means that negates that act of ibadah because we no longer have the intention, the correct intention, meaning that ikhlas lillah, it's not uh, sincerely for Allah or it's not directly to Allah. We've now made an intermediator. We've committed an act of shirk because now this person is praying to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though they kind of, they, they do intend to worship Allah, but they've done it incorrectly, and it's even the incorrectness is related to their intention. So, that has to do with the this principle, the maqasid. Al-amur bi maqasidiha. So, because this person, their maqasid, or their intention, is fessed, you know, it's it's um, negated, then that means their act of worship is uh, negated. So that's the amur, that's the affair that's been negated. If that same person does the same acts of ibadah, that perfect salat, and they direct their intention totally to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it's done correctly, and we say, we would judge that, you know, this person has done the correct prayer. And they've done it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So al-amur bi muqasidiha. That that act of ibadah bi in is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they had ikhlas. That ikhlas has to do with uh, the this principle that we're talking about. That sincerity to Allah. That all actions are judged by their intentions. That goes back to the dalil in the ma'amal bin yad. Verily actions are tied to the intentions. I hope that that's clear. And there are many other evidences as well mentioned for this qa'idah, but that's that's sufficient for us. And some of the evidences are weak, uh, ahadith, and so forth. But uh, the scholars of fiqh, they use those, uh, those principles. So what's meant by this qa'idah is that the intention behind something uh, that the, there must be the correct intention behind worship okay or that we judge acts of worship in accordance with their intention and when we look at the nia the 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 place of our intention that is in the heart the place of the intention is in the heart it's not the the physical acts that we're doing but the niya the qast the qast fi ta'a wa taqarrab ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is in the heart so that intention to worship and draw nearer to Allah this is an issue which is in the heart when we talk about this principle and we talk about the intention, there are two things we want to look at. And number one is that our intention, it does two things. How many things does our intention do? It does two things. Number one, tamayiz al-ibadat an al-adat. Our intention distinguishes worship from custom. We're going to talk about that. The second thing that it does, tamayiz al-ibadat ba'duha an ba'd. That the intention also, it distinguishes worship from other acts of worship. Now let's get to the examples. 
So in the first way that the intention, uh, the thus and the intention distinguishes between uh, worship and custom. Let's look at an example. So if we say someone is doing the actions of prayer, we mentioned. Okay, they're doing the actions of prayer. And those acts, some of them may resemble stretches and exercise and yoga, in fact. Some of the actions may resemble some of the poses you might do in yoga. Okay, so if a person is doing those actions, we, we see two people, okay, for, especially for a non-Muslim, if they see the Muslim praying, they're, they're not really, generally, they may not be aware of what they're doing. They may think he's exercising. They may think they're doing something, okay? What distinguishes that from yoga or from some exercise that, uh, that resembles acts of prayer? For example, maybe a person's in Rukur. How do we know they're not just really stretching their, their back and straightening their leg and just really stretching their back and trying to get that good stretch? How do we know? And this is the point. The Nia is what distinguishes it. So the person who has does those same acts in order to uh, do it as a stretch in some physical activity, then they'll get that for which they intended. It's not, it's not referred to as Ibadah. But if they are doing those same acts and they're doing it in the context of the prayer and their intention is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to the book and according to the sunnah, then they will be rewarded for that. So uh, the niyyah distinguishes between those two acts. Let's look at something else that might be a, a better example. For example, if you take a shower, you make ghusl, the general ghusl, okay? You just get under there and you... you, you uh, wash yourself, maybe you wash your private parts, and you you may even clean your nose and your mouth anyway, okay? Make a tamad madh madh and blow it out, okay? So you're, you're taking this, but your intention was just to uh, clean yourself, or your intention was to cool yourself off in the hot sun, okay? And then you pray after that. Since your intention was that, by making the ghusl, this will not be considered the ghusl that is going to suffice you for the prayer. But if your same intent, you did the same actions, and you did that with the intention to remove the physical and spiritual impurities, you know, it was an act of wudu and an act of ghusl, an act of, um, you, you did that to prepare yourself for the prayer, it becomes an act of ibadah. So therefore, your niyyah in those, those scenarios is what distinguishes between worship and between washing yourself, or worship and cooling yourself off from the heat. The other way, the intention we talked about, that how it ex distinguishes between worship different acts of worship, okay? Uh, for example, if a person, they, they fast, for example, and they fast, uh, they're, they're fasting on a Monday, for example, and they're doing, so they're fasting on Monday, the, the, the Sharia fast, okay? Their intention and also the time distinguishes that from the fast of Ramadan. So there actually the time and the actual act of worship is going to distinguish between those acts of ibadah. Perhaps a better example might be if a person is uh, praying dhuhr. They're praying dhuhr. Uh, or, or during the time of Asr. They... Um, they're praying what, what's going to distinguish obviously the times but maybe they woke up late or whatever the case may be and it's now entered the time of Asr and they pray they're praying Dhuhr what's going to distinguish especially from an external but even 
for that person, what's going to distinguish their dhuhr from their salat al-asr is their intention. They intended to pray dhuhr, so they're praying dhuhr. They intended to pray asr, so they're praying asr. So that's how your intention distinguishes uh, from the various acts uh, of worship. So the last point I want to mention about this qaida or this principle, which is al-amur bi muqasidiha, meaning that the affair, as we mentioned, or the uh, issue, is in accordance with what was intended. Okay? An example that we could drive home, aside from those acts of ibadat that we mentioned, for example, if someone was going to rob uh, a home, okay? So, someone is a thief, and they have a car, okay? And they have a ladder. These are their tools they're going to use. So, this person is using their car... The car and its asl is what? It's mubah. It's something which is permissible to use as a vehicle. And there is no uh, ajr for using a car. And there is no sin for leaving using a car. Okay? And there's no sin, obviously, for using a car. So it's something, it's mubah. It's permissible. Okay? But, and the same thing with the latter. Okay? So this person... This thief is going to use his car with a ladder that he purchased to go rob someone's house. Okay? And therefore, this person, if we look in the context of this qaida, al amur bi muqasidaha, this car, which is normally mubah, this is something mubah. Okay? It's normally something which is mubah, which is permissible. But now this car is being used as a vehicle, literally, for sin, to commit a sin. So it no longer becomes something which is mubah. If that was your intention of using this car for that purpose, and you even purchased it perhaps to use it for haram and stuff like this, then using that car, of course, for those purposes, becomes haram, impermissible. So that's because why? Al-amur bi muqasidiha. The same with the latter, because it's something normally mubah, something normally permissible, but now you're using it as an instrument to do something haram. Another example might be eating an apple. Okay? And... Normally, the apple is something mubah. But you have the intention of eating this apple for sahur, for example, as a means to make your body stronger to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by fasting for his sake uh, after you finish and once the time for fasting uh, begins. So you eat this apple, which is normally mubah, and your intention is to use it as something to strengthen you to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that you become rewarded for using that thing which is mubah, and therefore it is now something which is uh, mustahab. You know, you'll be rewarded for that because your intention was good and you used it for good. The ends uh, to a halal means. You use the halal mubah ends to a halal means. So you'll be rewarded for using that. And so we've given an example of, of both. And another example that I like to think of when I look at, for example, those extremist groups, those takfiri groups that use uh, suicide bombings, they believe, and if you look in Arabic, they, what they describe them in as they call them... Uh, Amaliyat uh, istashhadiyya. Okay? They call them um, 
martyrdom op operations. You'll see that in Arabic, a lot of times those Tekfiri groups, when they're talking about individuals from their group, from their sect, or from their uh, jama'a, who do these uh, actions, that they call them, they give them the name of martyred, they call it martyrdom, uh, uh, martyrdom operations. Okay? And they use something which is mubah, like the car, and then they fill it with explosives, and then they do some, uh, some evil act with it, drive it into a mall, drive over old ladies, you know, doing all these kind of crazy, insane acts. They have now taken something which is mubah, and they have changed it and used it in a negative, sinful way to do evil, so the Amur bi muqasadiha, that now that car has now become weaponized. It's now a weapon of evil for conducting evil. So al Amur bi muqasadiha, they will be their jaza is punishment for that because they have done something wicked and sinful. Even and this brings up another qaida which is related to this that we use all the time when we say, for example, al ibra bi haqaiq laysa bi musammiyat. The reality of something is in its substance, not in its name. So this is pro perhaps this qaida is far'in. It's a, a subsidiary of this main principle. Al-ibra bi haqaiq laysa bi musamiyat. The reality of something is in its substance, not in its name. So although they call these actions, for example, those takfiri jihadi groups, they call them uh, martyrdom operations. We refer to them as suicide bombings, which is what they really are. That is the, the substance. But they have changed the name to glorify these acts, to entice the youth to participate in this kind of evil. So now they have changed the name, but the substance is still the same. It's still some guy putting explosives on himself, or some woman putting explosives of herself, and going to a beach and blowing up people. Or going to an old lady's house and trying to kill all the ladies while they're praying bridge. This, it's still the same act. It's not uh, any different. They call it martyrdom. We call it suicide. Okay? So, there's a, you, you can see where al-ibra bi haqaiq, laysa bi musamiyat, the reality of something is not in its name, but it's in its substance. And we've talked about that many times. I hope this gives us some basic introduction of uh, this uh, qaida. And until the next lesson, when we sit and we go into the next uh, qaida, which I believe is um, uh, al yaqeen la yazal al yaqeen la yazul al yaqeen bi shak. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jal. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the Shaitan. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala Muhammad.